Salam and hello there. I am Asif and welcome you all in Deshi Raid. Today we have a guest, Dr. Syed Farid Alatash. He is a Malaysian author and educator. He is serving as a professor in the Department of Sociology at the National University of Singapore. I must mention that Dr. Farid is coming from a well-known family of scholars with historical roots in the Arabian Peninsula, a family which has given out a standing intellectual, religious and political leaders in Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. Most notable are Syed Muhammad Nakib Alatash, a philosopher, and Syed Hussein Alatash, a Malaysian sociologist. Salam and welcome Dr. Farid in Deshi Raid. Salam, Asif. Thank you very much for this opportunity. You're welcome. I'm so happy and delighted to have you. First opening questions to you is, what is the Muslim conditions in the contemporary world? Well, that's, the, that's a very broad uh, question. Um, I, I think the Muslim condition is, is very much um, similar to, to the condition of uh, other peoples in the, in the so-called third world or the global south. Um, people across, across Asia, Africa, and, and Latin America. Um, um, economic conditions of um, degradation um, high um, income inequality, um, um, you know, income gaps between um, different classes of people, a great deal of economic um, exploitation, um, states, uh, governments that um, care little for the welfare of the people, um, highly kleptocratic uh, states, um, meaning um, states that um, live through corruption, and live off uh, the you know the sweat of the um, of the masses, uh, with very little um, uh, states that consist of um, politicians um, and uh, officials with very little integrity, um, and um, to make matters worse, they many of these states are beholden to the the world powers, um, uh, to the U.S., uh, to the Europeans. Um, in, in the sense that they're not, these states are not really in control of their own uh, destiny. Um, so it's, it's you know, overall a, a, a very um, a bad situation, a very sad situation, very, very pathetic. What I have seen from your work that you always talked uh, and you have taken a very critical position uh, uh, in re with regard to Eurocentric idea and point of views. But today, uh, I am more interested to present a critical point of view from within, from within Muslim societies. And therefore, my next question is the fear of being judged for an individual Muslim within Muslim society and outside Muslim society has made many Muslims mute as spectators. Uh, and how difficult it is to be a Muslim in a Muslim society, in your opinion, in compared to the Western liberal societies? Well, um, I, I feel that um, in, in many Muslim societies, um, it has become difficult to be a Muslim um, if you believe in living according to the ideals of Islam, um, in your own particular way. Now, of course, I don't. I'm not referring to, um, uh, you know, to idiosy idiosyncratic um, uh, understandings or interpretations of Islam um, that um, somebody somebody might want to live by, and and therefore wants to have the the freedom to to live uh, that way. I, I'm talking about people who have a, um, let us say a moderate outlook on life, um, who are, um, are comfortable with their understanding and their um, uh, lifestyle, um, who, and who understanding of Islam and their lifestyle, they believe that their lifestyle, um, their way of life is, is compatible with Islam and they are comfortable with it. But at the same time, they are continuously being told um, that the way they understand and practice Islam is, uh, is wrong. Um, they are being told that they are westernized. They are being told that they are 
um, uh, liberal. Um, they are being told that um, ideas that they have about um, um, liberation and freedom of women um, are feminist ideas from the West, which are anti-Islamic. Um, in, in some countries, um, Muslims, uh, Sunni Muslims who feel that Shiites uh, are, are part of the fall of Islam are also being told that their ideas are wrong uh, and that Shiites should be rejected. So you have the problem of sectarianism. Um, so in other words, um, what we have uh, is um, a, uh, in, in, in the modern world, I, I, I believe, and this is especially true, um, probably truer in the 20th, uh, the 21st century. It's getting worse. Uh, it's gotten worse since the last century. Um, there's been, there had been a growing um, intolerance, um, growing um, influence of uh, extremist um, ideas among uh, Muslims that has tended to um, um, push um, what was considered normal, um, uh, Muslims whose behaviors and thoughts and ideas were considered to be normal or mainstream, they have been um, pushed to the margins and they have been made to feel uh, marginalized and they've been made to feel under threat because indeed they are under threat because they are, uh, they are told that their beliefs are wrong um, and uh, in some cases, uh, they are even um, um, they, they, they lack um, certain um, freedoms or certain liberties um, in their countries because laws have been put into place um, which make it possible for religious authorities to um, arrest people who are said to, uh, to uh, flout um, um, the rules of, of Islam. Um, I mean, for example, you know, in in, um, in Malaysia, in some states uh, in Malaysia, it's possible for the religious authorities to arrest um, and or fine um, a Muslim male for not attending Friday prayer um, for, uh, I believe, uh, three uh, uh, consecutive uh, times. Um, I, uh, Malaysian Shiites have been uh, detained or um, arrested. Um, their homes have been raided um, for possessing uh, Shiite material or for uh, engaging in Shiite um, um, uh, rituals. Um, so there are um, um, such restrictions that are being uh, placed on, on, on people. Um, so what, what happens is that um, it ends up being easier to be a Muslim in a non-Muslim country, um, which is not ruled by a particular interpretation of Islamic law, or um, which is not ruled by um, a Muslim government that feels that it has to, um, you know, play to the gallery um, and be seen to be um, uh, enforcing um, um, Islamic law, if not Islamic law, at least. They should. They, they feel they, they should be seen to be enforcing Islamic uh, values, their interpretation of, of Islamic values. So, in such a, a, a condition, um, uh, it makes it difficult for people who are believing, practicing Muslims, but whose beliefs and practices are out of line with the the dominant view, the view that is supported by the state, the view that is supported by the dominant uh, ulama. Uh, by the dominant uh, clerics. If, um, so if you're out of line with that, um, it's very difficult to, to be a Muslim. Um, you will have to hide, you have to, to, you know, to live, um, uh, to, to, uh, to practice um, um, your uh, rituals um, in secret. Um, you may not be so open, you may not be able to be so open about your beliefs for fear of um, uh, you know, reprisal from the, uh, from the authorities. So I think this is one of the of the problems that um, Muslims face increasingly in uh, within the Muslim world, problems that they would not face if they left, if they they lived in a, in a non-Muslim uh, country. Dr. Farid, you have 
You have interestingly uh, mentioned about these laws put forward by Muslim states. And also you have uh, mentioned about that uh, these ordinary Muslims, those who are easily uh, motivated to, uh, you know, to gather popular support and to criminalize other Muslims having liberal thoughts, are also deprived of education. And if we look very closely to the Muslim experience in the contemporary world, you would see there is lack of education within the larger Muslim society, especially the lack of critical education with regard to science and with regard to social science. So do you, and at the same time, apart from the education, there is this popular silence as well among the Muslim academics living in the Muslim majority countries. We, wouldn't, we do not see uh, more often that uh, Muslim intellectuals are coming forward and and uh, you know, questioning the popular belief. Now, my next question is, do you observe any silence from the side of Muslim intellectuals to critically question the popular belief and fundamentalist common sense view in, in Muslim majority societies? Well, you know, most, uh, most Muslim societies um, are not uh, democratic um, states. Um, they're, they're ruled by uh, more or less uh, authoritarian regimes. Um, and people don't have the civil liberties uh, that they would have in the, in the West. Um, and um, if you talk about Muslim intellectuals, certainly if you're speaking about intellectuals who are attached to, to universities, um, most of the universities are, are state-run universities. Um, and uh, the, the intellectuals are, are in, in other words, they're academics who work in these universities and are dependent um, for their livelihood on their, on their jobs. Um, and they often face um, severe sanctions from the university authorities or from the governments if, um, uh, if, if they are seen to, be, uh, to get out of line. Um, so I think that does play a role in, in severely um, curtailing their critical um, uh, voices, um, you know, it, it, it plays a role. So, so we we have, um, you know, what, what you what you have is the um, the, um, the the lack of an intellectual movement um, among scholars and intellectuals, um, which doesn't just include academics, but it includes, you know. Um, activists outside of the campuses, it would include writers, uh, journalists, and other educated people. Um, there is a lack of, of, uh, of an intellectual movement um, and, and therefore a lack of, of, uh, of social movements that would um, tend to counter uh, these, these more extremist um, currents. Um, and I, sh I should also add that um, I think the, the more um, moderate um, intellectuals, um, uh, they, they are um, fewer um, in influence. They, they, they are lesser in terms of influence. Uh, their, their impact is much lesser in terms of the influence on the society, um, partly because the, the governments in Muslim countries for, for decades had tended to oppress the, the, the more moderate or so-called liberal groups, uh, and they tended to support uh, the more extremist groups. Um, in some cases, they supported the extremist groups, but in other cases, um, what they did was to oppress or to not make it possible for the more moderate groups to emerge. Um, and, and in some cases, uh, they even suppressed the, uh, the Islamic movements in general so what you have is, is a radicalization of, uh, of the Muslim uh, population where more radical ideas became uh, popular um, and that served to marginalize uh, the more moderate or so-called liberal, liberal ideas. And um, I think this process happened since the 1950s, 1960s. Um, so it's been, it's been going on for 50 or 60 years. And, and we are suffering the, the consequences now in the sense that the, 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 the more liberal um, or moderate groups um, are less powerful, less influential, far less dominant. 
um, and uh, the general population, um, I think, is being influenced by, uh, by the more extremist ideas. So we've reached a situation where even terms like um, liberal have become uh, dirty words. Uh, they, are, they are associated with evil. Um, feminism, the term feminism is also associated with, um, uh, you know, um, with westernization and with, uh, with, with evil and with, um, you know, with, um, um, uh, with, with apostasy sometimes. Uh, so th th this is, you know, how uh, this is w w what has uh, come to um, Muslim society thus far. But I do agree with that. But the question is about solving the crisis. So will this silence uh, would resolve uh, the issues that Muslims are currently facing from within and from outside? What, what silence are you, uh, are you referring to? Uh, for instance, silence of being critical of uh, popular opinion as well as uh, fundamentalist common sense based practice of religion. Yeah, no. I mean, this this silence um, is is very uh, problematic, um, and uh, it it simply facilitates the increasing um, um, the, the the increasing influence of uh, extremist ideas, um, and it also facilitates the um, um, the spread of these extremist ideas among the general population, among people who are uh, ordinarily not extremist, um, you know, people who are not ideologues. I'm talking about ordinary common people, but who would come to believe in some ideas that had been uh, spread by the extremists. I mean, if, to give you an example, um, many uh, people, uh, ordinary people, ordinary Muslims believe that um, uh, an adulterer should be killed. And that this is uh, a proper Islamic law, and there are no two questions, uh, there are no two ways about it. Um, and this is because uh, of what they are hearing from the uh, from the religious clerics, from the from the ulama, um, who you know who have that view as well, um, and who are not able to give the population um, a variety of opinions that you have. Uh, among the Muslim ulama, among the jurists, you know, for centuries, uh, where there's diversity and vari variety of opinions, um, they, they're, they're not able to do that. Um, so the population doesn't hear of that. Uh, similarly, when you have, um, uh, you know, for example, um, the, the, the Ch Charlie Hebdo affair, when you have the publication of uh, cartoons that insult the Prophet, um, the impression that is given to the general Muslim population is that in Islam, we are required to defend the Prophet by uh, engaging in violence against uh, the, those who have insulted the, the Prophet. Um, again, there are no two ways about it. Um, uh, you don't have alternative voices um, that spread to the general population, that spread to the masses, that spread to the rural areas. Um, you know, an alternative voice that says this is not how the prophet himself behaved to uh, to people who insulted him, um, or um, uh, you know that uh, inform people that um, uh, it is more dignified to ignore the insults because our prophet is not in need of uh, of uh, defense, um, or you know to tell people that um, uh, the faith of Muslims is not affected one bit by such. Uh, cartoons or such insults. You don't have these kinds of alternative voices. Instead, what you have is the whipping up of emotions by, by some of the religious authorities. And this is also used by politicians uh, to, gain, uh, to gain points. So this is the danger of, of uh, the silence is, is this, the spread, uh, the, it facilitates the spread of uh, extremist views. If we consider this, uh this response, Muslim response, to the Charlie Hebdo attack as Charlie Hebdo cartoon debate, and for instance, other activities that had happened in the name of Islam and in the name of protecting religion and protecting uh, the honor of uh, our prophet. Uh, 
Now, I, I can sense a, a, a confused notion among the larger Muslim community. And I, I often ask this question to myself, and which I would like to ask you now, is that why do Muslims are utterly confused to respond to the violence uh, that is happening in the name of Islam across the world and within the Muslim society? Well, I think, I think a number of things uh, are happening. Um, there are obviously people who, who believe that this is the way to respond, right? Um, the way to respond is through uh, violence. Um, and they, as I said earlier, they whip up the emotions of others who, who, would, who would then follow them. Now, uh, why do people believe in such responses? And why um, are there many people who would follow um, uh, the leaders? Um, I think, uh, first of all, um, the followers... Um, are very often, um, you know, people from societies, um, uh, Muslim groups, communities who have a sense of insecurity. And I think this is very much a, a condition of the Muslim world, um, that we have a sense of insecurity. We have a sense of insecurity because we know that we are not in charge of our own destiny. You know, we know that um, um, the destiny of our own nations is not in our own hands because um, we live under rulers who um, are doing the bidding of other governments, of other powers. Um, if you just take the Palestinian issue, for example, um, with all the, you know, the resources of the, uh, well, don't even talk about the Muslim world, just talk about the Arabs with all the resources of the Arabs, they have not been part of the solution. In the sense, they have been actually um, against the solution. Um, uh, so it would be clear to any observer that um, the Arabs have not been able to solve the problem of the, uh, the, the, the Palestinian uh, problem, have not been able to um, help to bring about a, a solution uh, and to give um, uh, you know, sovereignty to the Palestinians. Um, and uh, not, not only have they been, have the, have the Arab states been weak, uh, and in general, the Muslim world, not only has the Muslim world been weak and not been able to solve the problem, but in some ways they have been part of the problem. Because um, uh, to the extent that, um, you know, the U.S. is, um, is, um, um, is, is, a, is, a, is an actor um, that... Uh, um, tends to um, uh, play uh, uh, you know, a, a role in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict that is biased towards Israel. Um, uh, well, you also have um, some of the Arab states um, that are allied to the, to the US. Um, and these Arab states, therefore, are not able to play that uh, role of, uh, um, uh, let's say, mediation, or even going beyond mediation to force the hand of the US. Um, so the, I think the, the, the Arab states and the Muslim world in general has utterly failed in, in terms of playing that, uh, uh, that role. Um, so, um, um, and when you, when, you, when you add to that other issues, um, the, the utter lack of um, um, economic development, a kind of economic development that, is, that brings... Um, peace and security and dignity to your own people. Um, you don't have that in, in, in much of the Muslim world. Um, what, look at the Muslim world contribution to world civilization. Now, the Muslims remember the contribution from the past, the so-called golden age of Islam, for example. Um, but what is the contribution in the last uh, 100 years or the last 200 years? Uh, it, it's been virtually um, nothing, um, even compared to the contribution of uh, the the other non-Western civilizations, you know, compared to the Chinese, compared to the Indians, for example. Um, uh, in education, the Muslim world is is is, is lagging uh, behind. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, if you just look at a more narrower 
aspect, you look at the you know academic uh, publications, you find that in the in in the Middle East the um, the Arabs have uh, performed very poorly um, uh, in terms of uh, scientific uh, publications um, in comparison to Israel, for example. So. Um, I think there is an overall sense of insecurity. Um, and when you are in that situation of uh, being insecure and feeling uh, insecure, it's very easy to, um, you know, to, for, for, the, for your leaders to whip up emotions um, and for you, therefore, to feel that you are doing something about your plight. Uh, and you know, getting angry with uh, the cartoons um, you know, burning, uh, uh, setting fire to an embassy um, or, um, you know, killing uh, a person associated with uh, uh, insult to the prophet uh, is, uh, you know, is a way, I suppose, of, you know, feeling that at least you're in charge of, uh, of something and you're doing something about it, unfortunately. Well, so uh, this insecurity leads to confusion, if we take that from your point. Uh, so my well, no, I would, you know, I, I, I would, I would, I, I, I would, I would rather say that the insecurity, um, it's not so much that it leads to confusion, but it gives, um, it gives a role um, to the the rabble rousers and the fear mongers uh, and the extremists um, in the community. It gives a role to such uh, leaders um, rather than to the more, you know, rational-minded. Um, leaders. Um, so I think, I think this is, this is, you know, the, the role that insecurity plays. Uh, and, and with that note, uh, th there is this uh, identity politics as well in the, in the entire conflict. Like, for instance, you mentioned the Arab uh, Israel conflict and the recent solution process. Uh, and what we would observe there that there is this identity politics and nationalism and political orientation and overall social choices which are playing uh, underlying roles in, in the crisis uh, with regard to Arab-Israel conflict and other conflicts as well. Now, my next question is, to what extent Islam has been overpowered or threatened uh, by identity politics, nationalism, political orientation and social cho choices? Um, it, it is more um, a problem of contestation between different orientations among Muslims. Um, now, of course, Islam itself as a religion, um, as, uh, you know, as a revealed religion, as a deen, as we say, uh, is not under threat. Um, but what is under threat um, are certain types of orientations among Muslims, certain um, ideological orientations, certain um, schools of uh, political and economic thought, which I would say are more progressive. I think those um, are the aspects of, uh, of Islam. I think it's more accurate to say uh, aspects of Muslim um, society and culture um, which are being overpowered or which are being marginalized, which are being under threat. Um, for example, just to give you a very simple example, for since the, uh, since the 19th century, um, you have, um, you, you, we have witnessed the uh, marginalization, the gradual, the beginnings of marginalization of Sufism, of the Sufi tradition within Islam. The Sufi tradition, of course, has been um, uh, very central to, to Islam for centuries. But with the rise of uh, the, the modernists and then the extremists among the modernists, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the lack of tolerance um, uh, of tradition, the writing off of tradition as uh, wrongful innovations, as bid'ah, as, as some of them say, um, with the rise of that kind of orientation, um, there was uh, you know, disdain for, for Sufism, which was seen to be um, uh, based on uh, wrongful traditions and wrongful practices. Um, so Islam had to be, from that perspective, uh, they believed that Islam had to be purged of those things. Um, so um, the, uh, uh, the Sufi tradition 
uh, Sufi um, practices, um, Sufi um, um, ideas, um, uh, theological ideas, metaphysical ideas, and even the culture of the Sufis, uh, which you know uh, extends to the arts, uh, to literature, to the visual arts, um, to music. Uh, many of these things um, became uh, marginalized, and the Muslim world experienced a decrease in uh, uh, in, in uh, the Sufi way of life. Um, so that that's an example of uh, how. Um, uh, of this overpowering that you were referring to, but it's not the overpowering of Islam. It's, it's the um, Islam is still there, uh, but what you have is a more um, uh, legalistic, uh, uh, um, authoritarian, and um, extremist um, understanding and interpretation of, of Islam. Um, in some cases, allied with the state. In other cases, the state is indifferent to them. So they gain more uh, power and um, um, more um, cultural, spiritual based, and I would say even progressive uh, orientations are sidelined or marginalized. I think that is the, the problem that we are facing in the Muslim world today. With that problem, we are also facing another serious and grave problem, which is the problem with science education. Uh, Problem with education is an overall problem in the Muslim societies, but especially the problem with science education. And previously you have mentioned like how uh, Muslims have contributed in the last 200 years. And the example could be the Muslims' contribution in the scientific arena. Uh, so my, my question is, uh, I, I personally don't see a central debate within the Muslim ummah in favor of a very robust science education and support for it. So why don't we see that central discussion on the importance of science education within Muslim Ummah? Um, well, you know, it, it, it's really not only science education. I, I think it's education in general, because you, um, you actually see um, a similar problem in uh, education in the social sciences and, and humanities. Um, so there is a very serious problem in, in education in general. Uh, and if you just look at the universities across the Muslim world, um, our performance um, in terms of academic uh, publications across the different fields, whether social science and humanities or sciences, um, uh, is very dismal, um, compared not only compared to the West, but even compared to other um, um, country, you know, non-Western um, countries, um, and certainly, if you look at um, the the um, performance in terms of um, scientific uh, research um, in countries uh, uh, in East Asia, in Taiwan, in uh, uh, South Korea, um, of course, Japan, um, and uh, in Singapore. Um, and, uh, but even you know, in, in uh, lesser developed countries like India, uh, you, 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 we, we have performed very uh, poorly. Um, and of course, a lot of this has to do with the fact that Muslim countries spend very little on education relative to what they spend on uh, arms, uh, r relative to what they spend on, uh, on defense, right? Um, and if, if you also add to the fact that uh, there's a great deal of corruption. Uh, there's a great deal of political and bureaucratic corruption. Um, and uh, politicians seem to be spending a lot of time involved in politics rather than the administration of the, of the state. Um, so there's little attention given to um, various important sectors, not just education, other sectors also, uh, such as social welfare, for example infrastructure development. Many sectors are, are poorly attended to. The Muslim countries are more interested in securing their border, less interested in uh, cleaning their domestic uh, affairs with regard to education. Uh, but at the same time, we see from ulemas, uh, not from all of them, but a certain group of ulemas would be very reluctant to oppose uh, modern education, be it uh, science, be it social science. And 
and we would see a popular support for that also. Uh, at least uh, the country that I am coming from, Bangladesh, we see there is a huge debate concerning uh, what type of education we should have, the modern education based on rationality and deduction, or an education that only glorifying the past and uh, not that much critical about the topics that we are experiencing. Given that context, do you think that in, in near future, there would be a consensus among the Muslims uh, across uh, uh, the world uh, that uh, inter-civilizational encounters of mutual learning of science and education is possible? There, there, there shouldn't even be such a, a debate um, because it should be clear to, uh, to anyone that um, we need to learn modern science. Um, the, 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 the question is not, the, 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 the choice is not between learning modern science on the one hand or um, learning the, um, the religious, the so-called religious sciences of the Muslims, uh, which were uh, developed and cultivated in the past. That's not the, the um, uh, question, or it should not be the question, because that's not the attitude of the Muslims of the past. Um, when, you know, the Muslims in the pre-modern period, especially, you know, in the 8th and 9th, 10th centuries, uh, they didn't have that kind of debate. Um, they avidly studied um, the sciences uh, cultivated by the Syrians, by the Greeks, by the Indians, uh, and they incorporated them into, um, uh, into their, their own uh, knowledge system. Um, but what, what the Muslims in the past made sure they did was to um, um, incorporate uh, knowledge from non-Muslim sources into an Islamic framework, into an Islamic uh, worldview. Of course, they didn't use the term worldview. There was no such term, right? But that, in fact, was what was the case. Um, they, they had um, a view of... Um, uh, reality. They had um, a view of the nature of reality. They had a view of um, the, the, the nature of um, revelation. Um, they had a view of um, what um, knowledge is in Islam, what constitutes knowledge. Um, in other words, they had a particular epistemology, epistemological framework. Um, and their view of the nature of reality, their view of um, um, uh, what was considered, uh, what was valid uh, knowledge um, was related to the ethical position. Um, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the an Islamic ethical position. Um, so in other words, they worked out their worldview um, and they, they made sure that um, uh, they were conscious of the fact rather that knowledge that they acquired from other sources, from, uh, from non-Muslim sources, um, uh, was uh, fit into that particular worldview. That's the issue. That is really the issue. Uh, and that is what the Muslims should be, um, should be concerned with now. But I think most of the, of, of the, of the ulama are, are not sophisticated enough to, uh, to consider matters in this, uh, in this particular way, right? I mean, it, just to give a, a, a parallel, uh, an example from a parallel case, um, we're living in a, in a time when we are conscious of the need to decolonize knowledge, right? Yes. Um, now, the question is not whether to, uh, to study the sciences or the social sciences from the West or not. That's not the question. The question is how do we incorporate knowledge from the West within a decolonial framework. Um, to decolonize doesn't mean to reject uh, knowledge from the West. It means having a particular attitude towards knowledge from the West and incorporating it into our uh, knowledge system, into our theories, into our research, into our curriculum in a way that is decolonial, right? So similarly, um, when we're talking about Islam, the question is, is, is not at all about whether we should accept or reject Western knowledge, but it is how we incorporate Western knowledge into an Islamic framework.
I, I can recall one of my memory of walking with you in the street of Istanbul. Once you told me that it's very important to master Western thought, to be critical of it. And uh, that to some extent really influenced my thinking as well. That if you want to encounter a thought, you have to master it. Uh, you have to build your knowledge on that. And yes, it is, it is true that we are, I mean, we are not having that discussion in the larger context. But this time, I would, because you have already mentioned like the Muslims in the pre-modern era were not like that, the way we are thinking now. And I would like to recall an example from a cover photo of your book. So your book, which is an Islamic perspective on the commitment of uh, commitment to interreligious dialogue. This book you have published in 2008, and this book has a very interesting cover photo. Maybe you have choose it intentionally. The cover photo, it, it, it was a painting where it, uh, it shows that uh, there is a meeting happening between St. Francis of Assisi and Sultan al-Malik uh, of Egypt. And the event was happening uh, during the fifth crusade uh, around the year 1219 or 1220. And that was a beautiful painting. Uh, and it, it, it presents uh, the dialogue of, of uh, Muslim and non-Muslim during that time who are engaging in even conflict. Now, now what we see, what at least I observe in, in my contemporary experience is that there is a lack within Muslim society of seeing the non-Muslim point of view and seeing ourselves as others, see us, uh, in other words, empathizing with non-Muslim is, is a skill that one uh, needs to learn and a society needs to develop. Why do we miss that skill uh, at large? Well, um, I think it, it, um, this goes back to the, the earlier um, point about Muslim insecurity. Um, Muslims being pushed back, uh, pushed into a corner, feeling that they, their destiny you know, has been taken away from them and they're not in charge of the destiny. They don't um, uh, you know, have the ability to uh, determine their own path. Um, and you know, when, you are, when you're in that situation and you're wrapped up in your own uh, problems, it's very difficult to empathize uh, with the other. Um, and when your, your religious leaders are, are telling you um, um, giving you a picture of the world as black and white, that the world you know, consists of Muslims and non-Muslims, and the, and the non-Muslims are, are kafir, the non-Muslims are infidels, the non-Muslims um, 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 do not have a place in, in the hereafter. Um, uh, so you, you, when, you, when that is drummed into you, then you have a view of non-Muslims as um, less fortunate human beings. Um, and um, and you know you know the term kafir, uh, the way it has been been taught, um, has extremely negative uh, connotations, um, and um, uh, it's very it would be very difficult if you see the entire non-Muslim world as as kafir, it would be extremely difficult to have empathy for for them, um, and. Uh, so I, I feel that this this is um, a very much a manifestation of uh, of modernity. Um, I, what I mean is um, most, the situation of Muslims in the modern period um, that has created this insecurity and that has given a role, therefore, to the more legalistic, um, um, fiqh-oriented, you know, jurisprudence-oriented um, scholars. Um, for whom the world is black and white, and that that black and white world includes, you know, uh, this division, um, uh, simple division between good um, Muslims and bad non-Muslims. Um, so I think that is, you know, to put it in simple terms. Uh, I, I put it in simple terms, but I think that um, goes a long way towards explaining um, uh, why we tend to have less uh, empathy or, or we lack the ability to empathize with non-Muslims. And I think that lack of empathy is manifested in, um, in many ways. Um, you, you, you find that um, generally Muslims um, 
don't respond uh, with with a sense of sympathy for uh, to um, uh, to events in which non-Muslims um, uh, suffer, right? Um, I think there was a lack of empathy uh, or sympathy for for people who who died, um, um, you know, uh, in, in in the 9/11 uh, incident. Um, and I think uh, when we have uh, tragedies, uh, calamities um, around the world affecting non-Muslims, um, I, I, I don't really see uh, religious leaders um, or Muslim personalities from around the Muslim world who, uh, who are vocal um, in offering sympathy. Um, on the other hand, you do see in the West, many Western, Westerners um, who offer sympathy when calamities or tragedies uh, uh, um, uh, fall upon uh, uh, Muslims, um, in, you know, in whatever it is, you know, whether it's in Palestine or uh, or Iran or um, you know, or Kashmir or other parts, uh, or, or or now in uh, uh, in, in Xinjiang in uh, in China. Um, so I think we do have a problem in terms of how we you know um, how we view non-Muslims. But you have mentioned a point which is uh, the Islam, which is very much legal, the jurisprudence Islam. And that is uh, something that most of the Muslim countries are currently facing. Uh, and that's my last question to you uh, as, as a part of a solving point. How the contemporary Muslim societies could deal with a jurisprudence based idea of Islam which is very much uh, more into the application of law, but not into empowering human beings and individuals and uplifting them for, for a better empathetic society. You know, the, the, the problem is not so much jurisprudence, but it's the, um, the legalism, what I call the legalism. Uh, and by that, I mean... Um, the reduction, you know, reducing Islam to jurisprudence, um, as if jurisprudence is the most important um, dimension of Islam. Uh, and, and I think it is not. Jurisprudence is necessary because jurisprudence is necessary to, to help Muslims to, to go about their, their activities and to understand, um, you know, um, how they should act and, and, and behave um, and, and, and confront various uh, problems um, in this world. It is definitely necessary, but it should always be subordinated to um, morality. Um, and this is not my personal view. It's not, um, um, and it's not a modern so-called liberal view. This is the view of Islam. I mean, this is the view of the Holy Prophet because the Holy Prophet said that he was um, sent uh, to um, to um, uh, perfect um, morality um, to to complete the morality. Um, um, I think the, the the hadith goes something like "In Allahi baathni li utamima makarim al akhlaq um, You know that I was sent to um, to perfect um, uh, the akhlaq or the morality. Um, so it's and and I think this was understood by the. Uh, by the scholars um, of the past, um, uh, especially um, the, the Sufis of Islam, um, that the basis is morality. Jurisprudence is important, but it is utterly useless and even dangerous without morality. Because the goal of Muslims is not to follow a rule or a regulation. The goal of the Muslim is to lead a good life to be a good human being. And that is dictated by the morality, by the sense of morality. The, the rules and regulations are, on, are only to facilitate that. Um, but what the, the, the Muslims call uh, the maslaha, the interests of society, um, or the, um, um, the, um, uh, you know, the general uh, uh, good, uh, these cannot be determined by by rules and regulations. They can only be determined by our sense of, uh, of morality. So I think um, it's, it's very important that we um, have 
uh, more discussions and, and debates uh, and also conscientize the masses about the centrality of, of akhlaq or, 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 or morality in, in Islam, in Islamic tradition and, um, and the role that akhlaq um, uh, needs to play um, so that people have a um, more perspective on, you know, on the proper role of jurisprudence. Thank you very much, Dr. Farid, for your time and for attending those questions. It was really an interesting experience to have a conversation with you. Thank you very much, Asif.